afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I'm here to introduce and welcome Shane Harris, to, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Shane Harris is here today to discuss The Watchers, the rise of America's surveillance state. Using exclusive access to key government insiders, he chronicles the rise of America's surveillance state over the past 25 years and highlights a dangerous paradox. Our government strategy has made it harder to catch terrorists and easier to spy on the rest of us. Harris focuses on the role of a handful of key figures, including Reagan-era National Security Advisor John Poindexter, as they campaign for information technology to identify terrorists. This led to a wide degree of warrantless surveillance, unhindered by Congress. The nexus between terrorism and technology has complicated the ongoing conflict between security and liberty, and it's time for a national debate on the issue. Shane Harris is a staff correspondent for National Journal and has twice been named a finalist for the Livingston Awards for Young Journalists, which honor the best journalists under the age of 35. He is a frequent guest on national and international media, and he has provided analysis and commentary for CNN, the BBC, the History Channel, and NPR. Please join me in welcoming Shane Harris to Microsoft. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, thanks to Microsoft for putting this together and for having me as part of your speaker series. Uh, I'm used to doing these kinds of addresses, usually for... Uh, bookstores and sort of crowds of general audiences and um, I always try to you know tell people that don't get don't get scared of the book it's not a very tech heavy book it's presented in a very sort of user friendly kind of way but this is really fun because I can really just kind of geek out with most of you guys so I'm gonna get to use all kinds of jargon and you know not have to use shorthand anymore which is really fun um, but um, uh, to give you a little background on how I come to this topic, um, I started my career as a journalist covering information technology. And to sort of give you a sense of where I was at the time, it was in early 2001. It was sort of the post-dot-com collapse. And everybody was predicting that government, federal government spending was going to skyrocket on information technology, which it sh surely did. And that government was going to sort of become the new place where all of these dot-com refugees came and, and were trying to sort of rebuild their businesses. So I really got hired on at a magazine called Government Executive Magazine, which is sort of like a business week for feds, basically, um, covering IT procurement policy, which was sort of the dry way of saying um, the IT business in government. Uh, and it wasn't uh, long uh, that I was on that job that the 9-11 attacks occurred, and pretty much everybody who was a journalist in Washington, or probably anywhere, at that point just had to figure out how to sort of pour whatever had just happened into the beat that you ordinarily cover and to find those kinds of connections. Um, and it became pretty obvious really quickly that the technology story that was revealed by 9-11, specifically as related to the government, uh, was going to become sort of one of the great memes of the sort of post-9-11 era of terrorism. And this was this notion that government agencies who were collecting all of this information on terrorism and various threats to national security had failed to connect the dots and to sort of connect their databases about what they knew. And so this is sort of how I entered into the topic of intelligence and national security, was coming at it from this IT perspective. We're talking about data and databases and information sharing and the like. Um, so it comes in from a sort of public perspective, because the IT procurement policy stuff obviously wasn't classified and hidden, uh, and then becomes this very murky beat about intelligence and national security and soon homeland security. And it's kind of important to remember that intelligence as a beat is probably one of the hardest things to write about, whether you're a journalist or an historian. Um, it is, after all, a trade craft that is based on keeping information <laughs> from public view, or in many cases trying to put out false information and deception. Um, and when I, whenever I try to give people a sense of what it's like as a working journalist day to day on this terrain, there's an analogy I like to use, which is um, imagine that you are a theater critic and you've been assigned to go cover the opening of a new play. And you go and you take your seat in the auditorium and you, uh, you sit down, the lights go down and the play begins, except the curtain never actually comes up. And instead, you have to sit there and train your ear and listen for snatches of muffled dialogue for footsteps, for people walking up and down stairs, occasionally someone drops a glass, maybe a gun goes off, and you're sort of furiously writing down these little snippets in a notebook to take them back later and try and piece them together into some kind of a mosaic that tells a full story. Um, occasionally, somebody comes out from behind the curtain and stands on the apron and sort of leans over into the crowd and whispers to you and says, you know, listen, I know I'm not supposed to talk about what's going on back there, but you're never going to believe what I just heard. Write this all down. 
And this is invariably followed by somebody who comes out usually wearing a dark suit and a rather dour expression who says, uh, we understand that someone's come out to talk about what's going on behind the curtain. There is nothing going on behind the curtain. We cannot confirm or deny that there is a curtain. Uh, and this is sort of the world we live in, is trying to um, ferret out a narrative from this rather obfuscated uh, performance that we're all watching. So this is one way of doing that uh, as, an, as a reporter, and it's probably the primary way that we try and, and get some sense of what's going on behind that curtain. But there is a separate way of telling a story, and it's really the kind of, uh, of craft, if you liked it, that forms the heart and soul of this particular book. And this really involves um, access and narrative. And to sort of build on the analogy, imagine somebody comes out from behind the curtain, except rather than standing on the apron and whispering a few secrets to you, they walk out into the audience, and they take you by the arm and they say, why don't you come with me? And they actually take you behind the scenes and let you watch from the apron what's going on or from the wings. Or they occasionally maybe let you take them out for a cup of coffee afterwards past the stage door exit and quietly catch a few moments with them to talk about what they see happening and the story they see unfolding. And it really was this kind of intimate access to people on a real personal level that allowed me to tell the story of the watchers themselves. Um, the title refers actually to five people, five men who have spent most of their careers working either in the intelligence community or the high-tech industry or both, who share a common and rather elusive vision. And that is the idea that with access to the right information and with the proper analytic tools, the government can actually predict crises and attacks and disasters before they occur. The watchers are the people who have built the large systems of data surveillance. They are the constructors of watch lists. They are the people who believe that we can swallow up a universe of information and sift through it to divine clues into patterns about what's about to happen and through these techniques to finally get ahead of that curve and to no longer be taken by surprise. Um, chief among the watchers uh, is a man who I never really imagined having the close relationship that I eventually did uh, have with him, but really sort of sits at the heart and soul of this and is a person I chose to make the narrative protagonist of the story, uh, and that is retired Admiral John Poindexter. Now, most of you will know um, Admiral Poindexter from his more notorious days in public service in the mid-1980s when he was the National Security Advisor to President Reagan and also was the uh, centerpiece and the central player in the Iran-Contra affair. Um, I had no knew him, though, in a different light. Um, he was actually something of a technology visionary. Um, in the early 1980s, actually, he came to the White House specifically given the task by the then National Security Advisor of modernizing the Situation Room. We like to think of the Situation Room right now as sort of being this technological nerve center, something that we see in 24 or in movies. And really back then, it was something of a backwater. Um, it didn't have encrypted communications. It didn't have teleconferencing. It didn't have a lot of the systems that people take for granted right now. And Poindexter was really brought in in the aftermath of the assassination attempt on President Reagan when this kind of communications... Uh, problem through the country really into chaos and the national security community as well to try and right that ship. And he did that over the course of the next couple of years, introducing modern technology, including email to the White House. He was the person who brought email to the, uh, the NSC staff. Um, Poindexter came back to government after the 9-11 attacks with an idea to do precisely what it is the watchers have always been trying to do, to build this massive technological system that was capable of divining the patterns of future disasters. And he liked to call it total information awareness. So TIA basically was premised on two concepts. One was, while it was true that before the 9-11 attacks, the government had lots of valuable information housed in the databases of the FBI, the CIA, the National Security Agency, and that really hadn't been fused, Poindexter posited that the terrorists who attacked on that day were also moving around in the public space among ordinary people and that they were leaving electronic footprints wherever that they went. They were renting apartments, they were making phone calls, they were renting cars, they were traveling by air. And that in order to really know what they were up to and to develop a narrative about their future plans, the government had to capture that information totally as well, and to try and fuse that with information held in, private, in, in the government databases. Now, recognizing the enormous threat and encroachment that this uh, caused to our traditional notions of privacy and civil liberties, there was a second component of TIA um, that didn't get a lot of press at the time, but is an important one to, to point out. Poindexter actually wanted to use the very same kinds of 
all seeing data analysis systems and these kind of algorithms to turn the watching machine back on the watchers to actually develop patterns that would tell auditors when someone using the TIA system was inappropriately looking at a file or was perhaps going on a fishing expedition unauthorized. He also wanted to use data encryption to build what he called a privacy appliance into the system itself such that an analyst sitting at a TIA screen might not actually see names at all or even locations of the people in the data but rather mainly the patterns and that only later under demonstration of probable cause and from or with order of a judge could they unlock the encryption and see the names behind this faceless information. So as a technology reporter this was rather intriguing to me and I was aware of Poindexter's more notorious past, but it's important to remember that at the time that he was undergoing uh, the Iran-Contra hearings, I was about 11 years old. So there really wasn't much memory on my part of his political past. And the magazine I was working for at the time was much more interested sort of in the mechanics of op the operations of bureaucracy and less the politics. So I tried, uh, unsuccessfully I might add, to get an interview with Admiral Poindexter. Uh, at the end of 2002, after his program had been going for some time, he uh, attracted some, I should say probably unwanted on his part, national level publicity from a number of large newspapers. And the Pentagon actually put a gag order on him and forbid him to speak to the press. Um, he lasted in that office till summer of the following year, 2003, at which point the negative attention on TIA and as this sort of Orwellian kind of um, spying system simply overwhelmed it and basically uh, overwhelmed Poindexter along with it. He resigned in August of 2003 and the following month Congress pulled the funding for the TIA system. So I kind of figured, well, that story's kind of come and gone. TIA was here, it sounded interesting, but frankly lots of companies were in the market space at that point in the federal government talking about their various systems to connect the dots and solve the next attack. But there was still something very intriguing about what he was trying to do, specifically for the scale of and the ambition of it, and also the fact that no one in any of these systems that I had been hearing about and people had been pitching to me as a reporter had been talking about the privacy piece and the auditing piece, that kind of turning a system like this back on the watchers themselves. Well, in March 2004, about six months after he left government, uh, I got an invitation to come up to Syracuse University uh, and sit on a panel uh, talking about the media's role in homeland security. And as enticing as an invitation to go to Syracuse in the middle of winter actually is, um, I knew that I could not pass that up when I looked at the invited guest list and saw that John Poindexter would also be a panelist. Uh, doing a debate with Jeffrey Rosen, the noted civil libertarian and privacy authority, debating total information awareness itself. So I jumped at this chance to go up and try and meet Poindexter face to face. And it was, the symposium took place in a room about this size. And it's important to remember, I've never actually met him face to face. I've only seen one photograph of the man at this point taken after 1986. Um, so he's sort of like the J.D. Salinger of the intelligence world. You know, he's rumored to exist, and every now and then someone you know, gets a picture of him or something like that. Um, so I didn't know what he looked like, so I kind of come into a room about this size, and I'm putting down my bag and my, my, my briefcase and all that, and I hear this voice behind me that says, Shane Harris. And I turn around, and I look, and I see the name badge. It's John Poindexter. So I kind of you know, stuck out my hand, like, you know, how in the world did you know what I look like if I don't know what you look like? He's living up to his reputation, I guess. Here's the super sleuth. Um, and he started off by talking to me, uh, saying that he wanted to offer an apology, which kind of threw me at first, because I'm sort of expecting, like, the evil genius coming up to me, you know, like with the bald head and the cat stroking the cat and all this kind of thing. And he says, I want to apologize to you. And I said, okay. He says, you know, I, I know you tried to interview me a number of times, and you put through a number of requests to our public affairs office, but... Um, my, my friend Donald Rumsfeld, former Secretary of Defense, of course, um, said that I couldn't talk to reporters. And um, you know, it was really upsetting to me because there were a lot of people that really didn't understand what we were doing and wrote a lot of uh, incorrect things. And I thought, okay, well, this is, this is the moment now, right? He's going to skewer me. This is the reason he's come to Syracuse. He's not giving a speech. He's come to settle the score. Um, and he immediately said, he stopped himself and said, oh, no, but I don't mean you. I mean, everything that you wrote, I mean, I didn't like all of it, but... What I really thought was interesting and set your work apart was that um, you seemed to be more interested in what we were trying to do and not as much interested in me. And that was true. And he thought that, well, he didn't like all of it, that it had been fair and it had been very thorough. And so I said, well, you know, since you know, Don, uh, Don Rumsfeld no longer you know, has his hand over your mouth, I said, would you be interested in sitting down and talking with me, perhaps for a magazine article or a profile? And he said, well, I'll seriously consider that. So about a week goes by. And I get a phone call from him one afternoon, <clears throat> and he says, I've thought about your offer, and I've decided that I will talk to you on one condition. I said, well, what's that? He said, well, 
You have to agree to come out to my house for multiple interviews. We'll do them for several hours, and everything will be on the record and we'll tape record it all. Now, it's been said that one of the reasons that John Poindexter did not fare so well as some of his compatriots in the aftermath of the Iran-Contra scandal is that he really didn't understand how the media works and how journalists think. And then I knew this to be true at this moment because anyone who would give a reporter the offer of coming to hang out in the home of one of the most notorious political figures of the past quarter century and record the entire thing would understand that this is not an onerous request. <laughs> This is something that you, know, you live for, regardless of where you fall on the spectrum or what your ideology and your ideas are. Um, I, of course, jumped at this chance. Um, and really, I think what sort of developed at this point in this series of meetings that we had over the next couple of months was sort of like this thing I like to call Tuesdays with Maury, only it's Tuesdays with the Admiral. I'm not sure like who was Mitch and who was Maury in this, in this sort of concoction, but um, basically we sort of hung out for a number of months. And I interviewed him about uh, his past, about Iran-Contra, about his uh, career early on in the Navy. He had graduated top of his class from the Naval Academy in 1958. He'd had a me meteoric rise through the service. And we talked a lot about total information awareness and what he was really trying to do and what these ideas were and what really was it was that possessed him and that pushed him on this quest. Um, what I came to realize was that 9-11 for Poindexter was not really the beginning of a story. It was much more the midpoint. Uh, and this is true really of a lot of the watchers. And what I came to see was that where we enter this whole saga, if you like, of trying to harness information from the government's perspective, the national security community, to try and divine patterns, actually stretches back uh, a long, long way, back to 1983, um, specifically to October of 1983. On the morning of October 23rd in Beirut, Lebanon, a suicide bomber drove a truck laden with explosives into the barracks of the 24th Marine Amphibious Unit, which was stationed at the Beirut International Airport as part of a peacekeeping mission. Um, he destroyed the building entirely and killed 241 men, most of whom were asleep at the time the attack occurred on a Sunday morning. Poindexter was literally on call the morning of the attack. He was awoken by the ringing of a secure phone next to his bedside at his home in Maryland and got a call from the Situation Room informing him what had happened and that he should report to work immediately. Um, it fell to Poindexter and a number of senior officials, his colleagues in the intelligence agencies, to try and figure out what had happened in the days and weeks preceding this attack. And what they found, and what I learned in my further research, was that these events bore eerie parallels to the days and weeks and months before 9-11. Specifically, there were pieces of information that the intelligence community had failed to collect because they had stayed smothered in their individual silos and never shared across the broader community where they could be made of use. Specifically, from the spring of 1983 to October, the month of the bombing, the intelligence community fielded more than 100 individual warnings about car bombings in Beirut. None of them were ever fused or followed up on in a meaningful way, and they sort of vanished into the backdrop of violence and rage that was occurring in the capital at that time. Um, the U.S. Embassy had actually been attacked by a bomb in April of 1983, more than 60 people were killed, including most of the CIA station in country. FBI forensic investigators actually went in and examined the scene, and what they found was evidence in the bomb-making materials themselves of a very sophisticated, uh, uh, ingenious terrorist organization operating in Beirut that was clearly targeting major American targets. That information, that report, was never shared with military commanders at the base, or anyone in DOD for that matter, so that the commanders at the airport could fortify their defenses, which were already uh, quite low, shockingly so. Um, also, the National Security Agency, the government's chief electronic eavesdropper, intercepted a phone call from an Iranian official at the embassy in Damascus to a known terrorist in Lebanon, ordering him and his organization to undertake a, quote, spectacular attack against the Americans in Beirut, the Marines specifically. Well, there was only one place that the Marines were in Beirut. It was at the airport, but this information also was never pushed into the military chain of command until after the morning of October 23rd. So Poindexter sees this, and he realizes, as do a number of his colleagues, that the information to predict these kinds of events, or at least to have some awareness of them, is sitting in databases. It's sitting in paper files. It's in our own hands, and nobody's putting it together. And he really sets himself on this quest to try and do just that, to try and lash these systems together, and to also get the various 
counterterrorism personnel from the State Department and the Defense Department, the CIA and the FBI, all sitting in one room together to try and manage crises and to try and, and better get a grasp on what capabilities the government does have, which were considerable at the time for dealing with terrorism. So he obviously has some success with this in the early stages, but is completely derailed by Iran-Contra. And at that point, sort of goes away and sort of becomes something of a Washington pariah, where he's officially out of the scene, but just sort of hanging around in the background. Um, what came clear to me in, in, in these conversations with Poindexter at this point was, here was a narrative. There was a beginning of a quest in 1983. There was sort of a midpoint, a second act of it on 9-11. And the question that I had at that point really was sort of what happens now? Where, who are the people like Poindexter who are picking up this mantle, if you like, and charging forward with it in the government? And where does this go now? So it's about in 2005, about a year after I first met Poindexter, that I sort of embark on this final act of the story. Um, many of you will recall in December of 2005 a huge front page story in the New York Times which revealed that under secret orders from President Bush, the National Security Agency had been intercepting without court warrants the international phone calls and emails of Americans with suspected ties to terrorism. Now at the time, what we knew in the media was that there was some sort of a warrantless wiretapping program going on, the monitoring or the interception of specific communications. Um, but there was something about this story, I think, that besides the fact of its, of its enormous uh, sensational kind of significance, that intrigued me. There was, again, this sort of connecting the dots theme going on, this data component. And kind of reaching back to my uh, uh, early days as a reporter on the technology beat, I started ca calling a number of my contacts in the telecommunications industry. Um, the telecom companies, the biggest ones, AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, Quest, all of these guys, had huge federal government divisions. It's, uh, the federal government is often the largest single client for a number of these phone companies. And so I started calling my contacts and saying, well, have you seen this report and do you know anything about this? And quietly what I started gathering, and again in these snatches of conversations, was yes, we've seen that, but that's not the only thing that's happening right now. And I was among one of the first reporters to report that in the months and, you know, soon after 9-11, uh, officials from government agencies started showing up at telecommunications carriers and asking for specifically access to what's known as a CDR, or a call detail record. Now, you all will know a CDR basically as what shows up in your mailbox or your inbox every month as your phone statement. A CDR is essentially a transactional record of who calls whom, how long the call lasts, what the numbers are dialed and where those numbers are located. What I learned was that NSA had been gathering up this information secretly to try and divine patterns in this large pool of metadata, transactional information, that indicated careless communications were occurring, trying to understand when they saw particular connections of phone calls or timing patterns that it might indicate a terrorist group trying to talk to its members. So here we had government big intelligence agency wanting access to huge amounts of data, transactional information held largely in private hands to try and divine patterns to predict future activity. Well, it was basically total information awareness. It just wasn't called that and it was happening in a different agency. And as I pieced and peered more into this story, what I realized was that, in fact, NSA had been watching John Poindexter's program very closely. Uh, they had, in fact, talked a number of times. Uh, John Poindexter and Michael Hayden, who was the director of the National Security at the Agency at the time, had had a meeting where they talked about how Poindexter and his team of researchers might be available to NSA for its broad new counterterrorism mission. None of the team working with Poindexter or Poindexter himself were ever aware of the warrantless wiretapping program. But as it became clear to Poindexter as he went on, and these more of these conversations that certainly NSA was up to something and something different had occurred now at this agency and they were facing a data challenge that was more monumental than anything they had faced before. What I discovered in my reporting was that unbeknownst to the TIA research and point, researchers, researchers and Poindexter, NSA had quietly begun experimenting with the tools that he was trying to develop for data analysis. And the results were actually quite troubling. Um, as the NSA teams took this large amount of metadata, this telecom traffic that they've been collecting, and tried to put it into these sophisticated systems of pattern recognition that Poindexter was developing, the amount of information was so huge it literally crashed the system. It, these algorithms were simply too brittle to handle data on the scale that NSA was collecting it at the time. They literally fried the circuits. 
Now, NSA seemed to have an answer for this problem that it was facing, this increasing problem of massive data collection and an inability to analyze it. And the answer was, let's collect everything that we can now, because we cannot afford to leave any stone unturned or any dot unrecognized. And eventually, we or someone else will figure out how to make sense of all of that data. And unfortunately, that never really happened. Um, NSA, rather than try and narrow down its universe of information or build a more sophisticated system, in around about 2004 or so, became enamored of trying to invent uh, or use software tools that could display all of the information at once. It's sort of a very... Uh, uh, a bureaucratic reaction. If you are the agency that's responsible for going out and swallowing up all this electronic data, you want to make use of it the best way that you can and try to use all of it. So they became very enamored actually of graphic visualization technology. And the idea here was that we'll pour all this data into some sort of graphic analyzer and we'll put it up on a screen and to display all of these dots uh, representing people and places and events based on their connections to each other. And there was actually one particular system that was invented by a, a scientist who had worked for the National Laboratories for many years that actually displayed this as a big graphic representation that was so large it would take up whole screens. In the book you can actually see a picture of one of these things. George Bush is standing in front of it. Uh, this, that was the unclassified version. Um, and if you look at this, basically it displays these connections as a series of lines that is so massive and so impenetrable, it looks like a big explosion kind of emanating from a central point. Now, the critics of this kind of analysis came up with a name for this software tool. They like to call it the bag, which stood for the big ass graph. And the bag did not really excel at their, from their point of view at producing meaningful insights and specific revelations, but rather producing what the analysts like to call hairballs, these tangled masses of connections that really told you maybe a lot from an 80,000 foot level, but not very much about what was happening on the ground. And this was a problem, specifically for people in agencies like the CIA, who were running at that time covert operations trying to locate and kill suspected terrorists, to not be able to get an on-the-ground picture of who it is that you're supposed to go after. Um, one of my sources who at the time, in 2006 or so, was working, uh, had a managerial oversight for the drone program, the Predator Strike program uh, overseas at the CIA, told me that he was once presented with, for, with one of these hairballs from the bag by an NSA analyst who was really excited to show him sort of the social networks of terrorist organizations and kind of this kind of meta feel for how they were operating. And at one point, the CIA officer just stops this guy from talking and pushes the graph back across the table and says, you know what, I don't need you to tell me this. I need you to tell me one thing. Whose ass do I put a Hellfire missile on? This, it seems to me, was the fundamental dilemma. We're collecting all of this information, but for what purpose? How useful is it really? Can you get that kind of granular, actionable intelligence that's going to allow you to go out and isolate a particular terrorist or, better yet, predict an attack? I think NSA started collecting information on this scale for pretty straightforward reasons. The biggest being that information is power. In any bureaucracy, in any corporation really, the more information that you have, the more powerful you are. The more you refuse to share it, often the more powerful you are. And NSA is a prime example of this. But this compulsive need to collect and often to hoard data did not just reside in that agency. And in fact, it had spread across the entire intelligence community to the point that now we have spent billions of dollars, huge amounts of political capital and credibility in government to create a regime of official surveillance that is very good at collecting dots and is really not very good at connecting them. There are two consequences, as I see it, to this overcollection and the underconnection, which exists all the way up to today. The first, on the overcollection side, seems to me the risk of massive invasions of Americans' privacy and the risk that you will sweep in innocent people in these kinds of large data collection uh, regimes and programs. In fact, we have evidence that this has happened as recently as January of 2009. Uh, NSA, which was engaged at the time in a program of email monitoring, had inadvertently collected, in addition to the foreign targets they were supposed to be uh, uh, surveilling, had collected the emails of thousands of innocent Americans that had nothing to do with the targets that they were looking at. Now, so pervasive and sort of automated was this collection system that NSA did not even know they gathered up the email addresses until weeks later when they went back and audited the logs. This gives you a sense of sort of on what scale we're talking about here. The risk of the failure to connect, it seems to me, 
is obvious just looking at history. It is the risk that once again the intelligence agencies will miss the signals of a pending attack and will fail to connect the dots once again. And here too, unfortunately, we have evidence of that very thing happening as recently as Christmas Day. Um, as most of you know, uh, last December 25th, a young Nigerian man named Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalib boarded a Northwest Airlines flight from Amsterdam to Detroit and as they approached the airport tried to set off a bomb that he had strapped to his underwear. Um, what did the government know about this individual before he got on that plane? Well, there are three key things. One, Abdul Muttalib's father, a prominent Nigerian banker, had showed up at the U.S. Embassy in Abuja in, in November to report that he was afraid his son had gone to Yemen to join the ranks of Islamic radicals. Two, NSA, owner of the bag, had intercepted phone calls among known al-Qaeda operatives in Yemen mentioning a Nigerian who had been employed for a yet uh, as yet not detailed operation. A third piece of information, after Abdul Muttalib's father reported to the embassy that his son had gone to Yemen, officials there added the younger Abdul Muttalib's name to a database contained at the National Counterterrorism Center outside Washington of known or suspected terrorists where it resided on December 25th when he got onto an airplane. Now, why did the government miss these signals? Well, it goes back to the overcollection and the underconnection that I was just talking about. The officials of the National Counterterrorism Center, who are supposed to right now, ostensibly anyway, be responsible for connecting all these pieces of information, are literally drowning in data on a daily basis. This has actually become public in Senate hearings as recently as a couple of weeks ago. According to a senior official at the NCTC who is responsible essentially for analysis across the center, analysts there are receiving 10,000 names of suspected terrorists per day. 10,000 a day that they are suspect expected to move on in some way. That master database of names in which Abdul Muttalib was placed uh, in November of 2005 or 2009, sorry, today contains more than half a million known or suspected terrorist names or aliases. Even the people who manage these data sets will tell you that there are not half a million terrorists actively plotting attacks against the United States right now. There are certainly duplicates, there is certainly corruption in the data set, there are certainly errors. If you go into that center today, you will see on the desktops of most of these analysts six different terminals to connect to the 28 different information networks, not all of which are connected to each other, that are pouring in information every day into the center and that give them access to more than 80 individual data streams of unique kinds of terrorist reporting from across the intelligence and homeland security community. I mean, you understand now the scope that they're dealing with. The connection technology to harness all of this together simply doesn't exist. There is no Google, I know it's a bad word here, <laughs> there is no Bing for, 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 for the counterterrorism community. You cannot sit at a terminal today, type in Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, and expect to know all of the information held in every database about him. There are legal and technical barriers, but there are also policy and political barriers keeping that from happening. This is what I mean when I say in the book, and in the title of the book, that we are witnessing the rise of a surveillance state. And I use that title with some trepidation because I don't mean to, to, to give you the idea that we're developing a, a, a country like the Stasi in East Germany where we're spying on our neighbors, nor do I mean to suggest that the, the Constitution is somehow imperiled by this condition. But it is the fact that there is a default position right now in government to collect information on a very, very wide scale for the broad purposes of national security and for the purposes of surveillance, and to put off the question of how do you make sense of that. It's not that they're not trying, but this has become quite a secondary concern. And in the midst of that daunting challenge, privacy has simply fallen by the wayside and concern for privacy. I propose in the book that we actually change our focus and that we uh, admit, perhaps to the chagrin of many people in the privacy and civil liberties community, that essentially today there are very few technical and legal impediments to the government getting access to information. There's not much standing away from, the government, from a government intelligence agency and getting what information it wants. Rather, we should change our laws and our regulations and our policies towards what they actually do with that information once it's been collected. And it seems to me that that is how you begin to strengthen privacy and security at the same time. Um, I don't know whether or not John Poindexter had the right mix in all of this. But what I do know, and why I chose to focus on him really as a narrative protagonist in this long story, is that he was proposing a debate. 
he was forcing people to come to grips with the hard questions that still, it seems to me, were not really interested and ready to ask. He was forcing this debate between the trade-offs of privacy versus security, which are certainly as old as the Watcher's Quest themselves. Now, as controversial as these ideas were, some of them were followed, but some of them were not. You'll recall that when I told you about uh, John Poindexter leaving government in August of 2003 and I said the following month Congress publicly defunded the TIA program and all his research. Well, lawmakers inserted a backdoor provision very deep within the Defense Department Appropriations Act in 2004 that actually allowed funding for the Total Information Awareness Program to continue in the classified budget, the annex, the black budget, if you like. The pieces of the TIA program were broken up. The various research threads given new names, new code words, and they were absorbed by none other than the National Security Agency. All of the TIA research was continued by NSA except for one program, and that was the research into privacy protection and auditing. That was the one piece that NSA ditched. Uh, now, in the relative calm before another attack on the order of 9-11, I think is the time to start asking the hard questions that events like this pose. And I believe that we wait at our peril to have this discussion. Uh, over the seven years that I took to write this book, and probably close to a thousand people that I interviewed, regardless of where they fell on the political spectrum and their political positions and their ideology, on one point every one of them agreed. If there is another attack in the United States on the order of 9-11, this question of how do you balance security and liberty, security and privacy, will become a largely academic discussion. Our government will collect on a scale that few of us have seen to date, and they will be driven by urgency and by fear. And then I think that you will see many of the real infringements on individual liberty that up to this point many of us have only imagined or feared could happen. Simply put, the government will collect first and it will ask questions later. And when that happens, no one should be surprised because that is, after all, what the government does best. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about the book or anything I've discussed. Um, TIA is an interesting acronym because it also has a parallel in medicine. Uh, it's a mini stroke and it basically means a momentary loss of consciousness or understanding, <laughs> um, which seems to be pervasive um, in, in Washington now. And I'm really uh, kind of between a rock and a hard place. Do these people actually believe, I mean, are they that paranoid or are they just uh, kind of blindly executing like sharks, just doing a bad task extremely well without any thoughtfulness or insight as to what they're actually doing. It seems as though we have too much data and not enough information. Yeah, I think that that last part is definitely true. And people often talk about the difference between intelligence and information, and that information is intelligence that you've made sense of, right? Intelligence on its own is just sort of noise. Um, what I found to be true among among the people I profiled in the book is that. Number one, they do consider themselves patriots, and they feel that they're very, they're very passionate about the, 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 the task of national security. Um, but they're also technocrats. I mean, they look at this in a lot of ways as a technological challenge, as an engineering problem. I mean, Poindexter is certainly probably the prime example of that. Um, he's a big believer in everything he's ever done, that if you simply set your mind to something and learn everything there is to know about a problem, you can solve the problem. And for him, this is largely an engineering question. Now, he certainly recognized the threats to individual privacy and to liberty, and this is why he appro appro approached this privacy appliance that I was talking about. But there, too, that was an engineering design, right? That was, okay, well, we'll just engineer the privacy in. So I think there is oftentimes among, among these folks uh, something of a tin ear to the larger political implications, and it's basically also just the sort of comfort level that people have with this. I mean, the, the best example of this kind of disconnect, and this is another, the picture is actually in the book as well, um, the logo that Poindexter and his colleagues devised, I guess some of you are nodding, you know what I'm talking about, uh, for the Information Awareness Office, which was the sort of parent organization in which TIA and other research programs were contained, um, was the pyramid from the back of a dollar bill from the Great Seal of the United States. And it was topped with this all-seeing eye which was sort of like in this eye of Saron, you know, kind of casting this gaze down onto a picture of the globe. And in Latin, around the corner was written, information is power. And I, I talked to Boindexter about this, because this was after the program became publicly known. Like, this, people could not believe that it actually had this logo. I mean, it was like it was a joke or something. Like, you know, this is some sort of scam or it's a hoax. 
And, you know, there's a whole story as to why they designed it that way, and it's sort of, you know, this cute idea that it's like the, um, the I represents the I in information, and the A of the pyramid frame is the A for awareness, and the globe is an O for office, so I, A, O, all right, whatever. Um, sort of, you know, bureaucratic design by committee. But they never really, they thought this was really neat, and it sort of reflected their passion and their creativity about the idea. And to this day, he doesn't understand how it just completely creeps some people out. <laughs> and so to me, that's an example of this sort of, you know, of this, of this distance between what they're trying to do and I think what, you know, a large number of people think of the mission. Yeah. But did they, I mean, when it came to things like the, the NSA uh, wiretapping scandal, which was obviously, uh, I think, obviously illegal, uh, did they view those as sort of public relations failures, as, as legal failures, moral failures? What, did you ask Point Dexter about that? Did he have an opinion? No, yeah, I mean, I think that he, he, he uh, has an opinion about NSA wiretapping, which goes back to um, his views on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was the operative law that NSA was disregarding. Well, from their perspective, they weren't disregarding. They didn't have to regard it from their perspective. And he is sort of in that camp as well, as, as viewing laws like FISA as a restriction on the intelligence, cap uh, uh, the president's inherent authorities to do things like intelligence surveillance. They don't really see these things in moral terms, though. I mean, and it's important to remember that with the notable exception of the NSA wiretapping program, all the things that I write about in the book are legal. And what's happening today is legal. And they very much view this, I think, um, as a question of executive authority, that the executive branch, and specifically the president, has these authorities to do this to protect the country. So on the moral level, that, I think, is largely how they see it. And they have uh, fewer problems with the, the legalities of it. And I think you know, there's a level of cynicism there, too, that a lot of people in the intelligence community, I think, view lawyers as people who are trying to obstruct what they're doing and as a hindrance to what they're doing um, and have some real cynicism about that mission. Not all. I mean, not everyone feels that way, but there's a contingent. Yes. So um, you mentioned that um, Jeff Jonas had, has concluded that you know, basically this effort and privacy are incompatible goals. And I'd like to hear a little more about that. And if you think, or you know, what you think there might be um, actions that could be taken to try and turn things around so that you know, these audits can be reconsidered and, and those goals can be considered. Sure. So Jeff Jonas, uh, just for background, is um, <clears throat> now is uh, with IBM, but uh, he uh, a software designer who sort of made his bones building um, data mining systems for casinos in Las Vegas and developed a, product, a system called Non-Obvious Relationship Awareness, or NORA, which basically allowed casinos to find out who the card cheats were on the floor and who was working with employees inside the house to sort of to scam the house. Uh, that way. Um, he, after 9-11, he was actually in New York on 9-11 uh, and was very uh, sort of moved by the events of that day to try and offer his services and his ideas to people in the government and the counterterrorism community. And he actually met Poindexter at a retreat uh, in California, this very kind of high-level um, uh, weekend where people get together and discuss national security issues. So he and Poindexter sort of got hooked up in around 2002, 2003 to try and see if Jonas's ideas for data mining could be applied to this, this question of terrorism. And Jeff sort of becomes a foil in the story as somebody who he's one of the five watchers who I include in the sort of the key characters who kind of enters into this community and again approaches it from a technological challenge, but sort of has the kind of awakening moment that a lot of people have had that, wait a second, what you're talking about here is a challenge that is interesting and it is certainly daunting and perhaps we should devote energy and resources to it, but to what ends are we going here? And is this kind of total information awareness system really going to work in such a way that you can be sure that you will only find the bad guys and not either gather up information on innocent people or worse, actually finger them? and identify them as suspected terrorists. And the conclusion that Jeff came to was that you can't, basically, to paraphrase, was that this notion that Poindexter had simply could not overcome the problem of false positives. That you were never going to invent a system that was good at starting with a sea of unknown people and trying to find the bad guy in it. It's one thing when you have an individual target and you want to go after that person and see whose connections are, but this whole business of starting from scratch, it, it, it wouldn't work. Um, not surprisingly, Poindexter doesn't feel that way. But Jeff has really become, I think, sort of a voice for kind of this, the civil libertarian component of this, but looking, doing the critique from an engineering perspective. You know, he's saying, yes, there's a real threat to privacy here because of the way the system is set up. Um, my theory or my, my belief on what, you, what could change, um, it's going to take Congress, I think, 
really radically rethinking the whole notion of privacy and privacy law. Right now, the laws that we have on the books governing electronic surveillance, which have recently been updated, are still engineered in this very 1970s kind of framework, which is all about trying to govern the acquisition of information, the collection of data. You know, it goes back to the 1970s when there were very few ways to intercept a phone call. I mean, a wiretap really was tapping onto a wire. And so the government tried to write laws that restricted that kind of activity and went down to that granular collection level. It doesn't really make any sense anymore. Even the u ubiquitousness of information and the, and the many avenues by which it can be collected, I don't have to tell you all that. So it seems to me that the laws have to recognize that and start talking about use as opposed to collection. And right now, the law's not out there, and the regulations on that are really sort of vary by agency. There's no kind of overarching policy of information use within the intelligence community. And I think that inhibits privacy. It also inhibits effective information sharing and analysis. And so that's where we have to go now. Yes? Um, would you uh, draw uh, similar conclusions from uh, what uh, we've seen in the UK with uh, proliferation of cameras everywhere? Um, I mean, the, are they similarly overwhelmed over there from, if you have any awareness of that? From, Step is a US specific focus here, but uh, it's interesting to see what's happened to my country in the last 10, 15 years. <clears throat> yeah, well, whenever I was in my research, whenever people wanted to talk about you know, what we could become, they were like, just go to London. <laughs> you know? um, there it seems to me that um, the, the, the network of um, closed circuit cameras and the surveillance cameras serve a specific investigative purpose for a crime or an act of terrorism after the fact. I mean, if, you know, when there were, were the, bom the, the bombings some years ago. Um, the, camera, the network of cameras obviously allowed investigators to piece together who the people were who did this and to have some sense of the scene. I'm not at all sure that they're good from a preemption standpoint. And that's really what we're talking about. I mean, what I write about in the book is they're trying, these people, the watchers, are trying to do preemption. And I'm not convinced at all that, that creating just a, a wider net with different tools gets you any closer to that. Yes. Yeah, it seems to me that the, the probability of success of this system is upon par with uh, the stockbroker uh, successfully predicting the market. I mean, th th there the, the data is volunteered and mandated by law. Everybody can collect it and analyze it, yet nobody's been able to reliably beat the market on a daily basis. Yeah. How, how could we possibly imagine that such a system is going to be able to predict a yeah, it's a, it's a question that I've asked, you know, still wonder myself. I mean, again, I come back to, I guess, this thing. And to answer your question, I mean, I don't personally think that it's ever going to get to that level. I don't think that it can. I think the best that it can do, we can do, is create a system that maybe is very good at surfacing valuable leads or patterns for, info, for people to go look at. Uh, and, and follow up on further. And it's worth saying that Poindexter never imagined the TIA system taking over completely for human beings. He imagined it doing the heavy lifting uh, for people so that they could get to the, the harder task of the sort of art of intelligence analysis. Um, but why they're continue to be driven by it, I think it's because sometimes there are a few other options available. I mean, our, our network of human spies is just, there hardly is one. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw the 60 Minutes episode um, this past week about the woman who had been working for the CIA for many, many years and was producing valuable intelligence and spoke native Arabic and she'd been able to penetrate Al-Qaeda cells and now she's been drummed out of government on this ridiculous charge that she was spying for Al-Qaeda. I mean, there are only so many people like her in the government who are really good at that uh, and, and when they're not being drummed out of government or killed, you know, they're, they're already overworked as it is now. So I think that the intelligence community has sort of kept coming back to this technological approach to trying to solve the problem because sometimes it feels like that's all there is. Over here and I'll come back. Is there any relationship between TIA and Echelon? Well, Echelon, uh, no. N direct connection, no. I mean, Echelon is more um, uh, pre-9-11. Um, it is basically, Echelon's the code word that's used to, this, uh, to, 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 um, to talk about the system of signals intercepts by the NSA and their counterparts in Canada, Australia, uh, and the UK. Uh, the, the similarities, though, in terms of the spirit of both programs, I think, is trying to, um, through the use of things like keyword recognition and pattern analysis, analysis to try and hone in on the danger zones and the trouble areas before they flourish into real crises. But I never found any direct connection between those two programs. And in the back, you had a question. What are your thoughts on Watchdog? On Watchdog? 
What is Watchdog? Sharp's new uh, thoughts on. I don't know. Can you help me out? But what it stands for? Basically, mining social networks, trying to basically replace human human initiatives with advanced social social networking graph kind of analysis stuff. Okay. So graph understanding and for advanced research for 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 advanced analysis for rapid detection. Is what okay, saying. I think there's something called Minerva also. That, you know, these, these code names are fabulous, but. Um, it seems to me, uh, I, I, I don't know enough about the utility of it, but it makes total sense um, to, for the intelligence community at this point to be trying to mine social networks and to gather information there. One reason is that this is sort of what they do within the intelligence community now. I mean, they try and create social networks for terrorist organizations. And you know, the bag is sort of an example of that, a very clumsy example of it for a number of reasons, but that is essentially representative of the kinds of analysis that they're doing now, of trying to map out uh, uh, connections between people. <coughs> Interestingly, and I write about this in the book, um, one of the things I found was that from the intelligence community's perspective today, it is probably more valuable for me to understand who you're connected to based on who you call or how you move money or where you travel than it is for me to try and listen in to every one of your phone calls or read your emails. One, that would take a lot of time. And two, if you're a terrorist operative, presumably you're doing things like speaking in code and trying to evade my detection. So I may actually learn more about you from your relationships than from the content of what you say and what you write. And this, I think, it helps explain why you know, DARPA and other agencies are looking towards that field as a very rich uh, uh, area for intelligence. Yes? I'm, I'm curious to see if the watcher's opinion on how the counter uh, insurgency is going to work, uh, given that these methods are now publicized, people are aware of them. They're probably dealing with smart people in, uh, as terrorists. Are these, are these things going to really work? Or are terrorists going to wise enough and then start doing things that go under the radar and then no people are going to be caught, or like innocent people? Right. So, yeah, I think that the, the answer to your question is, you know, this is always going to be the nature of the cat and mouse game in counterterrorism, is that you're dealing with an adversary that is trying to become wise to your methods to detect it and then trying to evade them. And it's, that's always going to be a problem. Um, I know from talking to people, particularly in the FBI, who are involved in counterterrorism operations, that they recognize that. And so what they've had to do is, once they sort of get someone in their sights, if you like, and they have a known target they're following, this is to say nothing of trying to actually find the target in the first place, which is sort of more the intelligence community's job. But when people who are actually tracking these guys find them, what they will do is, basically, to the degree that they can, totally capitalize on any of their operational mistakes. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm following a suspected terrorist and, you know, one, he accidentally, he calls the wrong guy or he makes some little trip up or he does something that lets me get a view of his network, they basically live and die in the, in the FBI on those tiny little operational errors. So it kind of cuts both ways, in a sense. Um, but now, to your original question, I mean, that's always going to be the nature of the problem. I mean, we're not dealing with state actors that are going to go about doing things like building armies and constructing navies that they can't hide. It's always going to be this, you know, this, this kind of spy counter spy activity. You had a question next. Hi. Um, when we talk about trying to predict the stock market, it seems to me that what the intelligence community or the, the data gathering community uh, is engaged in is really information arbitrage. We have something the other guy doesn't, and that uh, you know whether or not that's actually going to be of any value is interesting. And by the way, if you like code names, you are at the right place. <laughs> <laughs> you want to share some with it? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting you talk about information arbitrage in, 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 you know, in the financial markets. There's a brief section in the book. It's just it's, I'll relate the story quickly because it's just so fascinating to me about how technology that's developed for it within the government eventually migrates into the private sector, sometimes unbeknownst to the people who are using it. Um, there was a company some years ago set up by a venture capitalist in New York called Monitor 110, which basically was 
the guy who started it was aware of things like total information awareness from reading the news and sort of when I interviewed him he said you know my idea was geez we should have some sort of way of gathering up all the available information on what companies are doing new products that they're announcing or fluctuations in stock prices or changes in the executive leadership to try and gather all that up and get a sense of where they're going and bet on it in the market and do this exactly this information arbitrage well as it turns out the technology that they built to do this was based in part on technology that was invented by the guy who built the bag. And I, and I won't go into the story because it's rather convoluted, but it's in, it's in the book. But this kind of tech, it eventually migrated out through the R&D cycles, and it's often the case in government R&D that everything is just kind of a recycled idea anyway. But this, you know, th th it is very similar. Uh, these these two worlds, where they're each trying to do, and I'm not sure that either one has really had much more success than the other. You had a question too. Yeah, what what protections on information use would actually preserve our liberties in, in your opinion? Um, <clears throat> I I really I mean I I I still really am attracted to this idea that Poindexter proposed of selective revelation, which was basically that if you're going to collect this data, let's encrypt it so that you can't see the names and that you can only unlock it and actually go find the names and the locations of the people if you can demonstrate probable cause and that that can you know, whether that's a judge who has to judge that or whether that's an intelligence committee or whether the president has to authorize that now granted we're talking about data on a huge huge scale here so you can imagine like we're not going to be doing this you know you know how we're going to do this sort of you know 58 times a day and maybe that's the point you know maybe this sort of forces the intelligence community to get more sophisticated uh, in this area. Um, it's important to remember too that you know the nature of the technology is going to make this very very hard. I mean one of the things I found that was so fascinating uh, in uh, my research was it was one thing for the NSA to have to kind of stay within the lines if you like when monitoring phone calls. I mean, if you have a pretty good sense of where a phone call is coming from you know, you can, you can understand, okay, is that a U.S. person or is it located in the United States? Fine. It was email that completely turned this upside down. I mean, the nature of packet switching and just the whole, the inability to know precisely who the sender is, where they're located. Um, and I don't see that problem abating at all. So again, this is why I think that you have to, you know, I'm not saying accept the fact that they're just going to collect it and, you know, don't try and govern that. But more or less, I mean, you have to focus most of the energies on the use. And I think the selective revelation is a big part. The auditing is another, is another part. Right now, the auditing, it's not automated in a way that people on the oversight committees or even in the inspectors general's offices can know for sure, like right away, that, uh, that, that something improper is happening. And what always ends up happening is that, you know, somebody goes in and does an audit six months later and they find a lot of, you know, infringements, many of them inadvertent and innocent and bureaucratic, and then everyone gets into a huge uproar. And then nothing happens. <laughs> we just kind of keep moving on and we say, well, such is the nature of things. Yeah. The, the idea of encrypting the individual names to protect identity and privacy sounds attractive, but it doesn't really work in practice. If, if I know somebody's uh, traffic patterns, I know their home address effectively and, and where they visit, I can link that to a name pretty quickly in the open, even if what I'm seeing doesn't have the name on Explicitly. So yeah, it's, it's a nice perfect. notion, but <laughs> but not quite. Yeah. No. Yes, sir. Okay, but continuing that theme, the issue is numbers. You, you can't. You're getting ten thousand names a day. You can't yeah. do that for ten thousand names a day. Uh, yeah. I mean, again, the, the British experience. I mean, in Britain, the security agencies you know, say they keep tabs on four thousand people. So you know, they've got those names somehow, but now they've got down to obviously four thousand named people that yeah. you know, they're doing their best to. Keep, keep an eye on. So in America, that would scale up to 20,000. So, so I guess the, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, do, do, do you want whatever agencies that there are, you know, keeping track of, you know, at that, that level, obviously, you do have the names and you know who they are. You know, it, you know, it, 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 is that going to work? I mean, it, it, you know, so, so the issue is, you know, do, do you envisage a future? I mean, in terms of connecting the dots, you're going to end up with some number of people, named people you're keeping a, a tab on. And the answer is, do you think that number should be 20,000? Or do, do, do you think this just isn't going to work at all and we shouldn't do it at all? Do you think it's 20,000? Do you think it's 200? What, what do you think the actual numbers are? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. The answer to the, what the number should be, I don't know. And I don't think anybody really 
certainly knows. I mean, the British example is instructive because there it seems to me they're saying, okay, we have X number of thousand known people that we're watching, and they have some sort of predicate for watching them. What I'm more concerned about, I guess, is the kind of thing that's happening at the National Counterterrorism Center where those people are supposed to be surfacing the names that you really ought to be watching from this gigantic pool, which is probably full of 98% false leads. Well, maybe not 98, but a large number of false leads. And what concerns me is that there's no layer of responsibility for that, either technologically or on a personnel level. I mean, in a lot of ways, what happened on December 25th was actually a success story. I mean, if you consider that, you know, those threads of intelligence I mentioned, you know, NSA got the phone calls, the father shows up at the embassy, somebody puts the guy's name into a database, CIA wrote a dossier after the father came in. So dots kind of got collected and moved around a little bit in their silos, but still there was nobody at that overarching line to say, hey, wait a minute, you guys at the NSA, you should be talking to this person over here. I mean, knowledge management, if you want to call it that, right? There's sort of no, no layer for that. And instead, the instinct is just to kind of dump everything into the database and to use that master database to do things like create the no-fly lists. And so it seems to me that there's a layer that could sit in the middle of this, like a filter that could take a lot of the uncertainty out of this and make it more manageable. What the number should be, I don't know. It's frequency analysis. What's that? Frequency analysis. The more often you see a name uh, in a list of suspected activities, right. statistically, the greater uh, probability that something is up. Yeah. And a lot of this is, I mean, shoe leather investigative work, too, right? I mean, the question is, it seems to me that the problem the intelligence community faces can be broadly described as, how do you get people out of that cloud and into the crosshairs where you can start actually doing real work and investigating? Um, and, and I think that's kind of where they are now as well. And then they can start doing that kind of frequency as well. Maybe one more question. Yeah, sure, one more question. It seems like, uh, I mean, someone like me leaves a, a big digital trail all the time. I buy everything with credit card, you know, I'm doing stuff online all the time. But a lot of these people who would be suspected terrorists seem like they're kind of off the grid a lot. Did you talk to anyone who, who addressed that issue? It seems like they wouldn't even be getting into the databases. It, surprisingly, they are on the grid. I mean, this is what we're seeing now, I think, is, um, well, two, 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 two responses to that. One, when Mike Hayden, the NSA director, uh, had to publicly come forward in 2006 to defend the warrantless wiretapping program. And one of the things that he said was, um, well, now terrorists are going to stop using, I'm paraphrasing, but terrorists are going to stop using phones and emails, and they're going to try and you know, go off the grid, essentially. And somebody asked the question in an audience that a speech he was giving and said, well, wouldn't they expect already that we were monitoring this stuff so they would be staying off the grid, essentially? And his response to that was, you know, you'd be surprised how stupidly many of them behave. Um, and what we're also seeing now is with, you know, Al Qaeda central sort of being weakened and now kind of being a core of ideology, um, the kind of revolutionary fervor of that, you know, kind of terrorism is spreading through the internet. And so there are whole industries of private analysts that have cropped up now who just monitor jihadi chat rooms and websites. And there you're not even looking at pattern analysis, you're simply looking at what the guys are saying. So I think that, you know, there's certainly going to be, again, this kind of cat and mouse sort of thing, but generally in the intelligence community, I think they've found that um, terrorists are communicating and they're going to try and monitor that. Thank you very much, everybody.